Okay, welcome to the beginning of this next part of class. What we're going to be focusing on here is pre-linguistic communication, everything besides communication. And so what we're doing here is we're starting our journey of language development. We've already talked about theories of why we think language development, why we think language develops, the different aspects of language, and the different cognitive and sensory skills that are related to the development of language. By this point, however, we're finally to the point where we'll be tracking the way language develops explicitly. In this module, we're going to concentrate on what happens from the moment a child is born to about the time they're ready to enter school. It's a very busy time where there's lots of development. We're going to move from the time when a child's language is almost reflexive to a time when they're combining words into rudimentary sentences. There's a lot going on that we have to get in in the next few weeks. And so in this section, we're actually going to be covering it from the child is born to about the time that they're ready to enter pre-kindergarten, not necessarily enter school when we think about it in terms of uh, kindergarten. So in this part of class, what we're going to be doing is speaking in this section about what happens from the time a child is born to about the time they're one year old. The reason why we're going to stop at this point is because it's at this point when children begin to say their first words. This beginning section is split into two lectures, and each lecture will have multiple parts. The first lecture is focusing on everything besides the expressive use of language. Included in that includes information regarding the interactions that occur between children and adults, qualities and quantities of the speech that's directed towards children, the impact of something called joint attention, early receptive language, and what happens in the first year of learning what words are. And so our first learning objective will be focusing on how the characteristics uh, on the characteristics, excuse me, of what's called infant-directed speech. I'm going to want you to know the characteristics of it and talk about why it might be valuable for language development of children. Additionally, I'd like you to recognize the basic sequence of joint attention and tell me why it's important for language learning. I'd also like you to tell me how auditory and perceptual development is related to the comprehension of language in the first year. Finally, we're going to review different theories of how children learn words so that we have a foundation for what happens when they begin to speak words. In this section, we're going to be focusing on what's called infant-directed speech. Infant-directed speech goes by many other types of names. For example, some call it motherese, others call it child-directed speech. In this section, we're going to describe what infant-directed speech is and why it's valuable for teaching language. And we're also going to talk about some of the controversies surrounding it. One of the first things to be aware of in terms of the way uh, language develops over the first year of life is in the interaction between a caregiver and a child. We know that it's very, very, very important, right? There's a certain type of language that caregivers use when they communicate with infants that may or may not play a role in the language development of children. This is what's called infant-directed speech. As we've mentioned before, you know, it goes by all these different names. Um, and there are characteristics of this talk that may play an important role in the language development of children, just like we were talking about. And so looking at some of these characteristics, think about it, right? The first of these is pitch. When we speak to infants, our pitch is traditionally higher than when we speak with adults. Additionally, there's often uh, a rhythm that adults use when they speak with infants. Sometimes they use a sing-song cadence. Um, another, characteristics of inf another characteristic of infant-directed speech is that there's typically lots of repetition of what's being said. There's something about the way this type of speech sounds that definitely maintains the infant's attention to the caregiver's voice. Uh, something that's interesting that's related to what we're speaking about is the fact that parents of children with hearing impairments often use a version of signing that's analogous to infant-directed speech. For example, they might actually sign in a rhythm much in the same way caregivers speak to infants uh, speak in a rhythm to infants. One thing that should be noted about infant-directed speech is that although it seems as though these characteristics are universal, there are differences that exist from culture to culture. Some of these differences include the responses parents make in response to a child's vocalization. What this means is that we know it's important, but we don't really know exactly how important it is. What I want you to do right now is to be thinking about how it could be related to language development. In addition, I want you to watch the videos that uh, are marked here at the bottom of the screen that are available for you on Moodle. And so, as you're thinking about infant-directed speech, 
What I want you to do is think about why this would be good for a, a young language learner. And so this is something that's going to come up um, in our first activity. I want you to think about, you know, how does, it, uh, how does it seem as though it's designed to encourage the child to participate? So what is it about it that seems as though that's the case? What do you think the intent of it is? You know, and also think about how it might aid in vocabulary learning, remembering that uh, it is a bit, you know, controversial. And so we're going to explain why that's so momentarily. So remember, infants are listening for all of the characteristics of infant directed speech that we had mentioned before. For example, there's something about the speech sounds, the pitch, the stress on different syllables and words, and the sing-song nature of IDS that intrigues children about it. Additionally, because this type of speech is so intriguing, children are drawn to study the facial expressions, gestures, and movements of the caregiver. In fact, studies have shown that infants prefer this kind of talk over, the, uh, over other sounds and other types of adult talk. And so when we think about characteristics of the caregiver, um, you know, another thing that we have to think about is uh, that it's not necessarily about the vocal or prosodic quality of the speech of caregivers. Um, you know, that's really, really what's key in these early conversations, right? There are other things going on. For example, it's sort of related to IDS. For example, caregivers will often focus on objects that children can see and hear. We know that as children get older, this actually changes, right? Also, think about how it relates to what we spoke about earlier in the semester in regards to the development of decontextualized language. Related to this point, we know that even as, caregiver, as children get older, the language of caregivers is often referring to what the child is doing or saying. The caregiver interprets what the infant is doing. The, their speech is often contingent upon what the infant is doing, whether it's interpreted as being intentional or not. We're going to speak more about this shortly when we talk about the development of intentionality. And so the next thing to consider is how it's useful. And so now that we've discussed both the characteristics of IDS that interest children and the particular things that caregivers do when they use IDS, we should now consider how, how it is that it's useful. Because parents are able to do all of the things that we've spoken about before, such as providing contingent responses to the utterance that a child makes in a dialogue, even if it appears as though it's unintentional, they can use these early exchanges with IDS to scaffold and shape the learning of children. For example, they may shape early babbling. So if a child makes a sound and the mother draws the infant's attention to the sound by using a pitch and a sing-song cadence, it might be possible that the child imitates or makes a sound in response. Part of the way this is done is due to what we've spoken about before in terms of infants tuning into the gestures and facial expressions of caregivers when they use this type of speech. And so, in thinking about the things that are attractive to the infant in terms of IDS, we should consider whether this is related to what we spoke about earlier on in the semester regarding the instinctual nature of language development, or if it's just something about the social nature of this that makes the infant interested. This is a question that has not been answered yet. What do you think? Is it something that's part of being human, or is, an art, or is it an artifact of the fact that, chill, that caregivers are doing something really interesting with their voices? Do you think this in any way could be tied back to the, uh, the whole nature versus nurture question that we spoke about earlier in the semester? Earlier, we spoke about the fact that infant-directed speech might be different from culture to culture and language to language. However, there's a reason why we've been speaking about it so much. We know that it's important in some way, but as we mentioned before, we're not really quite sure exactly how. And so, that brings us to this word of caution. Most of what we've discussed is based on research that's been conducted in the U.S. with babies of middle-class families. We know that babies everywhere learn to speak, even though the qualities of the language that parents use with children across the world might be different than what we've been talking about right now. So, the conclusions that we make regarding this must be taken with a grain of salt. In terms of clinical usefulness, we don't really know what we do know, uh, excuse me, we don't really know enough to talk to parents about how they should talk to their children. As an aside, we do know that it's important to talk to parents about talking, uh, talking more to children. 
This is something we're going to discuss shortly. And so, related to this point, we're, let's discuss that, uh, that question of culture a little bit more. We know, that the variations of ID, we know that variations of IDS have been documented across many cultures, but just like adult-to-adult -adult interactions, infant-to-adult interactions can vary based upon cultural background. For example, there are different values and parenting norms based on where you are in the world. So some cultures value verbal interactions more, while others value physical interactions more. It should be clear that the value a particular culture places upon these types of interactions will impact the quantity and quality of IDS. Again, no matter what, children across these different cultures still develop language. We've spoken broadly about the qualities of IDS and what interests children in IDS. However, we haven't talked about the changes that occur in language that caregivers use with their children. It should come as no surprise that language changes between caregivers and children as they progress through the first year of life. First, we're going to emphasize a point that we've made before. That is, that at first when caregivers use IDS, it's usually about things that are around the baby. However, this, is not, this does not necessarily mean that we're talking about objects. We can also be talking about actions. Additionally, we know that there might be changes in the length and complexity of the utterances that caregivers use as children get older. This especially begins to happen as children move into the toddler and preschool years. Interestingly, you can see on this slide here that the length of utterance of parents is still pretty much small when a child is about a year old. Remember, when we're speaking about IDS, it's more than just a one-way relationship. What the caregiver says is based upon some type of feedback they're getting from the child. And so, what we also know is a point that we're going to speak about a little bit later. The fact is that as children progress through their first year of life, parents begin to expect more from them. And so, the content and quality of their infant-directed speech begins to change to reflect this. And so, our learning objectives here were to describe the characteristics of IDS. Additionally, we want to describe why IDS is valuable for teaching language and some of the controversies surrounding it. This leads to the first activity. What I'd like you to do is to describe a specific way in which you think IDS could be valuable for promoting language growth in infants.